I'm, I'm Goran Enedic, I'm one of the fellows here at the Alan Turing Institute. I'm also from University of Manchester, where I'm Professor of Computer Science. I have a third role for today as well, so I lead uh, also the Health Tech Network that is co-organizing this event uh, with, with Alan Turing. So what I'll do really very quickly is to introduce the, the, the two institutions that are organizing uh, the events today. So the first one is Alan Turing Institute, and I actually have a relatively easy job to do because that there is a, a video that I think you've seen already. I'll try to comment it uh, on top of what you can see here. So Alan Turing Institute is the National Institute of uh, Artificial Intelligence and Data Science. Uh, it's been established a couple of years ago be the main aim really t uh, to advance data science and artificial intelligence in all the possible areas. I'll come back to that in a minute. But it is a hub for all the collaborative research that is going across different disciplines and across the UK. Uh, it is really cutting edge research institute. So, so we are doing the stuff that are looking at real world problems uh, the methodologies to do that, but also all the other things that go with with the data science and artificial intelligence. Intelligence. This is collaborative environment. There are a lot of universities that are part of it. I think you've seen the, net, the, the, the map. There are 14 universities that are part of this network across the UK. There are many institutions that are uh, also collaborating. So this is really a hub for data science research in, in, the, in, the, in the UK. Uh, let me see how I go back. All right, okay. So, the, the aim of Alan Turing Institute is to advance the data science and an artificial intelligence in many areas. And interestingly enough, healthcare is one of the main uh, areas where Alan Turing is looking to make an impact. So, the idea is to revolutionize healthcare in all the possible ways that we might think are going to be beneficial for patients and the, the society. But it is not only healthcare, uh, we are looking at smart engineering, uh, security, economy, how is data science, how data science can help economical developments, also what, how to make the algorithms fair, you, you probably see a lot of discussions of AI being not not completely without bias, so how to make it transparent, how to develop new types of computers to support data science and artificial intelligence, but also how to apply that to science and humanities, so not only at, at a, if you want, a, a standard uh, areas where artificial intelligence being used, and also how to assist uh, government and foster government uh, innovation. So, Alan Turing is the place for doing data science and artificial intelligence. The other, the other partner in organizing today's event is a healthcare network. So this is the UK Healthcare Text Analytics Research Network that has been funded by one of the UK's uh, research councils for engineering and physical sciences. The idea of this network that was established in 2016 is to bring together the community of researchers who are interested in making sense of free tax data in clinical domain. So clinical notes, clinical letters, discharge letters, uh, clinical literature, but also patient-generated data that you have in social media and, and, and blogs or patient diaries. So the idea is here to bring the community together along with NHS and industry to unlock the evidence that is, that is stored there. there. It is a very multidisciplinary network, so it is not only computer scientists like myself, but also we have a huge number of clinicians who are interested in this domain, but also patients, carers, uh, a lot of input from our colleagues in the legal and data governance uh, aspects of this work. This is one of the main topics of today's uh, workshop. We also have NHS on board, regulators, a lot of industry, and also charities. So this is a very multidisciplinary network that is, that is trying to see what value we can get from free tax and how do we gonna, gonna balance the privacy issues that we're gonna discuss today with, uh, uh, with, with the value that might come from this type of data. And I'll finish this very 
very short introduction just by an invitation. So the network is organizing an annual event that happens uh, around April every year. So the next one is in a, in a month's time in Cardiff. So we're going to discuss what is the current state of the art, what are the challenges in translating research into NHS, into practice. And also we'll have a panel that will be continuation of the today's workshop where we're going to look at the privacy issues in uh, dealing with free text data and also what kind of governance guidance and uh, safeguards we need to put in place. So I'll finish here. I'll be around uh, obviously the, the whole day, uh, but I, I, I wish you and all of us a very successful workshop. Okay, so thank you. So thank you everyone for coming. My name's Liz Ford and I'm a researcher in primary care down at Brighton and Sussex Medical School in Brighton on the south coast. And this is my colleague Lamise Hassan, who's a, an HDR fellow at Manchester. Um, so we're going to try, I'm going to let Lamise introduce the session, but I think I'm supposed to say, um, we we'll try and take questions at the end. But if there, unless there's something really burning that you just don't understand, in which case, just ask for, for a spot of clarification. Great. Thank you, Liz. So, yeah, my name's Lamise. I'm from the University of Manchester. Um, the type of research I often do is looking at public opinion about how people feel about reusing their health data. And I also do research looking at using free text in social media data. So very pleased to be here with you all. And Liz and I have the pleasure of introducing you to this area of free text. Uh, and that is what free text might be, how it's used as part of research, and what some of the issues might be today. Some of you in this room might know quite a bit about free text, and that's great. Um, please treat this as a bit of a refresher in that case, and bear with us, because as some of the people, as this is a public event, we don't expect you to have any prior knowledge of this at all. So what we would like to do is try and get us all on the same page so that we can contribute later to the participate in discussions and give you thoughts on some of the recommendations that we have. Okay. So where to start? Uh, perhaps the best place to start might be to consider the health record. So I'm sure, as many of you are aware, it's not just one health record. Really, it's several different records held in lots of different places. And two of the most common types of records that researchers might wish to use might be GP records, but we also might look at hospital records too. GP records um, are generally kept are electronically, so we're looking, talking about electronic data, <coughs> whilst hospital records often still relying on paper-based systems. And it may not surprise you, people in this, in this room, to know that often those two systems are not yet talking to each other. Where I'm from in Manchester, down the road, we have, this, we have Salford, which is quite ahead of the times in that they do share their records. But that's the exception rather than rule. So if you visit a hospital, they're not able to see your GP record. And what might happen is that after you've been treated, they might send a letter, for example, uh, or they might upload some of the codes that have been recorded from your, um, from your visit. Some of the key information might be uploaded later. And that might happen in very different ways, depending on each GP. You also might have this thing called a summary care record, which is a brief summary of the most important information to be shared with a wider range of people within the NHS. And that might be for emergency the care of, it might be simple information like allergies, medications, current problems that might, be, that might be used in the cases of emergencies, for example. And then we have these other types of records that might be completely separate from those, such as mental health records um, or, or, or sexual health services records kept there. And they're kept separate for lots of different purposes. So where to start? We'll start with the main record. So we'll have a look at the GP record. And to do that, and we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to invite you into my surgery. And my surgery is a little bit different. Uh, perhaps, first of all, because I don't have a medical degree. That's one thing. Also, I'm going to start my first consultation with a very unethical practice of allowing you to watch my first consultation and see what I actually write in this record. So welcome to my surgery. In fact, that's my phone going right now. Let's pick it up. Hello, Dr. Lamy speaking. Hi, this is Karina on reception. I've got Liz Ford for you, the pain in the neck. <laughs> Thank you, Karina. You best send her in. I'll just get her record up. Liz Ford. Come in. Please, take 
a seat, Dr. Ford. Thank you so much for seeing me today, Doctor. A pleasure. Please ignore all these people here today. <laughs> what can I do for you? Oh, well, I just, I've been having this terrible pain in my neck and shoulders recently. They feel really, really stiff and sore, especially in the morning. And the usual painkillers I've been trying, they're just not shifting it. Really? What kind of things have you been taking? Uh, well, paracetamol. Mm -hmm. um, and I often take ibuprofen as well. Mm. And how long have you been having this problem? Well, a couple of weeks, probably maybe a month. Um, but the pain's just getting worse. And my neck's so stiff now, I'm having trouble driving. I just can't move my head. So I thought I'd better get it checked out. I see. You've, you, you've done the right thing. Uh, can you think of anything that might have triggered this at all? No injuries? No, no, no I've not had an injury. Uh, fever? Infection at all? No. No. Right. I'd best make a note of that. I think the best thing would be for me to give you a quick examination. Would you mind if I took a look? No, that's fine. Oh, I'm so sorry, Doctor. I just, I do need to get this one. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. No, I will get on track. No, I will. I've, I promise I'll finish it today. It'll be fine. No, 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 no. No, it's... I'm so sorry. That was my new boss. Sounded urgent. God, everything always is with them. He's always on my case. I can never... Just can't keep up with, the, with the, what he asked me to do. You say new boss? Yes. Well, about three months ago, my old boss retired, and, and this guy's my new boss, and... Well, I won't go into it, but I just can't seem to do anything right. Hmm, I see. So have you been feeling more pressured, more stressed than usual? Oh, yes, I suppose so. I've been working late and every weekend. What with that and the neck pain, I just feel really, really low, like, down all the time. How have you been sleeping? Well, it does take me a long time to get to sleep. I mean, I've, my mind's racing with all the things I'm trying to catch up with at work, you know, and mm. I'm always tired. Uh, are you saying the two might be related? Well... Oh, I'm so annoyed. Why does he keep calling me? <sighs> <laughs> well, as you can see, my first consultation didn't go that well. Uh, but these are the notes here that we have. So as you can see, some of the main problems are recorded up here in the top corner. We call these the codes. So we've coded here stiff neck, stress work, low mood. And then we have a more detailed record of the consultation in the notes there that we call the free text. If we'd gone on a bit further, then we might have had the opportunity to try and diagnose Liz's problem. Uh, I would say unpleasant boss. I don't know if there's a code for that. Um, <laughs> and recommend some treatment or some course of action, perhaps there in the medication section. So, actually, have we got any clinicians here today? Any doctors? GPs? I know we've got a <laughs> cautious hand there. I'm just thinking, what, what other kind of things might you have well, recorded uh, from that consultation? Well, some of this stuff, unfortunately, we work in the UK on Monday, so <laughs> we don't use this system. Okay, so this is probably an unfair question to... Uh, it's nothing worth uh, listening. <laughs> uh, do we, Alan, we have Alan, don't we? You're a tired GP. What might you have recorded? We'll have, wait for the mic to come across. Well, I think it's actually a pretty good record. Um, there's quite a lot of practices probably give you a job. Um, I, what I, I suspect that what what you may have in a lot of GP systems is, is the same content but less structured. So what you've done is create codes as you go. It doesn't always work like that. Yeah. Uh, and quite often what you also get is a bit of patient passporting. So they, uh, the, the stiff neck is a classic example before you actually then identify the real problem. So I think you've focused in on the real problem. And I think overall, though, it's not a bad record. Um, a bit more structured perhaps than is typical, I would say, and a bit uh, potentially one-dimensional in that just one problem has really been presented and identified. Sometimes it's a bit more difficult, but not bad. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, as Alan talked about there, these are the types <laughs> of things that you might expect to see 
in a record if it was if it was a well structured one. So you might expect to see things like problems, family history, test results, uh, a diagnosis if they had one at that stage, uh, and an action plan there. Okay. And as we've discussed there, there's two types of main information that you might find in, in GP records. There are others, but we're going to focus on this distinction between that idea of the codes, those, are, those, those letters and numbers that you're seeing, with the headlines of the problem, and this idea of having the free text. One thing we didn't do there in the records is that sometimes you'll see um, a greater record of discussion where people might rule things out, for example, or recall that they've had a discussion with the patient. So, for example, they might have discussed whether... Uh, if, if there were any need for, for medications, and that might be so that people can provide a rate later record and determine what, why they did or didn't choose to do something. And that's important in, in passing that information to other health professionals. Okay, so codes, this idea of codes, uh, clinical codes, um, are this have been around since um, the one of the most commonly used dictionaries are read codes, which have been around since uh, they were developed in the 1980s, developed by James Reed. And these codes have got dictionaries, so, called, so to speak, collections of definitions and these codes that go alongside them. And they're made up of letters and numbers, typically. Uh, we use, have often used read codes, but shortly these are about to transfer to a new system called SNOMED, which is entirely numeric and is used more internationally across the world. There's a good reason for using codes in that they're searchable, so you might be able to easily, rather than having to look through all the free text, identify all the patients with a particular condition or on a particular medication within a practice. They're standardised, they're very useful for research and sharing information between practices and comparing them. And they're immense. They're huge. I think Liz was saying they're over 200,000 in, in a read dictionary. So they are huge. And just to show exactly how huge they are, we're going, we're going to play a little bit of a game so audience participation required in this one. And this is, I don't know if any of you read um, the Christmas edition of the BMJ, but one of my colleagues up at Manchester, Richard William, he loves codes, and he wrote a Christmas, Christmas guide to clinical coding. <laughs> one of the other things he did is look at a series of common fairy tales, and within them identify the events that happened and pick out some of the codes that corresponded with them just to show how immense they are. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to try and guess the fairy tale based on codes that we'll present in a random order. So, just to illustrate, and hopefully the tech will play, will, will work with me. Goran, could you pick a card, any card, at random? Hopefully this will work. Seven. Seven. So we have, in our first fairy tale, return to pre-existing conscious level. Someone came back to life. Would you care to hazard a guess at what fairy tale that might be? No, you wouldn't. I'm going to speak for you because otherwise <laughs> you could end this game quite quickly. <laughs> um, so we're going to go to someone in the audience. Karina, have you got the roving mic? Or? Uh, oh, I have. Yes, it's just I was trying to get a roving photographer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can, well, we can pick someone else who might have a loud voice. Anyone like yeah. to, to step in? Anyone like to choose a number? Choose a number. Any number. We'll go for this gentleman at the three. front. I will. <laughs> Number three. Okay. Big clue here. Accident caused by spinning machine. Would you like to have a guess at what? Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty. Very, Sleeping good. Beauty. very good. Okay, so if we'd got further on with that, I was hoping they would pick three very quickly. You would see <laughs> <laughs> Black Magic, Married, Contact with Plant Thorns, Excessive Sleep, and Female Baby. But yes, you were right. Sleeping Beauty. Well done. And just to, Liz can recap on the story. Oh, so in case, you, in case you can't remember your fairy tales, I'll tell it to you in read code form. So, female baby, black magic. Accident caused by spinning machine, excessive sleep. Contact with plant thorns, spines and sharp leaves, occurrence at other specified place. Concussion with more than 24 hours loss of consciousness. Manual resuscitation and return to pre-existing consciousness level, married. married. <laughs> <laughs> well done, right. Number two, right, audience time again. Who can we pick on? Anyone else like to hazard a guess? You, sir. Four. Number four, okay. Abnormalities of the hair. Right, 
Should we pick on someone else? Well, pick, you can pick another number first and then we'll... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we didn't hear that. Go on. Eight. Eight. We'll pick another one and then... Yeah, OK. Specific food craving. OK, we'll uncover the rest. So if we'd got further on with that, we have several here. And over to Liz again for the rundown of the story. So, newlywed, infertility problem, specific food craving, female baby, <laughs> imprisonment, abnormalities of the hair, fall from turret, foreign body entering into or through eye or natural orifice at other specified place. The code on the tip of every clinician's lips. <laughs> <laughs> Acquired blindness, both eyes. Patient cured, married. Yay, well done. OK, last one. I can tell you're getting the hang of this. I'm going to pick on someone else. Our, our doctor. Six. Number six. OK. Dwarfism. <laughs> How are you collecting the, the, the most obvious clues? This didn't go as like this in the... In the in anyone yeah. guess? <laughs> anyone like to guess? Seven. 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 We'll try seven. Okay. Whoops. Oh. Um. I just completely spoiled it there. Female baby. <laughs> yeah. We, it's Snow White. We'll go through it again. Over to Liz for our so, rundown. Female baby, pale colour. Mother dead, father remarried, has stepmother. Ran away, dwarfism. Found dead, suspected food poisoning. Manual resuscitation, married. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for playing along. Great. So it's my turn now. So I get to, tell, to talk about the more technical bits. So I'm going to run through why we might want to, given that there are so many codes, uh, and codes can be extracted um, in a way that leaves behind patient identifiers. So they can be used in a way that, where it's easier to protect patient privacy when they're used for a secondary purpose such as research. So given that there are so many codes, why might we be interested in also using the text that you saw in Lamise's record? for research. Why might we want to use it? How might researchers go about using it? How might they protect patient privacy? And what are the, the problems on the way? So we've seen that in general practice records, lots of information can be coded. We heard from Alan that in practice, not much information is actually put in the codes. Does any, anybody here have? Uh, access to their own uh, patient record through their GP. Yeah, I've got mine. I can look at my patient record on my phone, and every time I go to the GP, they don't code anything. They j all that comes up is the codes for the medications they prescribe me. And I'm thinking, why are they hiding that from me? I don't get access to the free text. So I find it, you know, what Alan said, quite quite interesting. So we've got GP free text, which might contain rich clinical information. But we've also got, for example, in other areas of the health service, like mental health records, there's not really any coding system that they use. They might use a few codes for billing, but most of the clinical information will be in text. And then the other area that's very important are reports and letters. So if a patient is, uh, has an inpatient stay in the hospital when they're discharged, a letter talking about what happened in that stay and the reason for it would go to the GP. If you, if you have a biopsy or a swab or a test taken and it goes to pathology, a letter will be written about the results. Same for a scan. And so there's these letters, uh, you know, if you're, if you're referred to a specialist for an outpatient visit and you get a diagnosis in secondary care, that will come back to your GP in a letter. So I think we can characterize these last four as communications about patients' clinical status between one healthcare and another. And what can we do with free text? Well, as Goran has said, we have a network of researchers who are interested in this. And sort of canvassing the different types of research they would like to do with free text, I've summarized it like this. So disease, disease surveillance. 
So that's kind of looking at the spread of disease in the population. So people have talked about tracking outbreaks of flu or pneumonia, but from symptoms written in text, because often these don't get hard diagnoses. Then we can talk, hospitals are really interested in using the text in their various reports to help plan or improve their services. So they might be asking questions like, in our hospital, how many people have cancer of a particular type? What stage and grade are cancers at diagnosis? And could we try and get that earlier? Did everyone who had a chest x-ray get followed up if there was something on that chest x-ray that looked like it could be cancer? So those kind of quality improvement questions. But more widely than that, also research questions. Like in a mental health trust, of all the people with schizophrenia, how many are having problems sleeping? And what could we do to help them? What are the typical symptoms of ovarian cancer that patients tell their doctor about first? So I'm going to use a, an in-depth case study, again, to show how free text has been used in a, in, um, uh, in a study that's had some impact. So this is a study about psychosis and about a drug called clozapine. Now, psychosis is a serious mental health disorder where... Uh, patients have symptoms like hearing voices and hallucinations. And clozapine is a drug to use to treat psychosis, but its rare side effects can be fatal, and therefore it's usually used as a last resort if other treatments haven't worked. At South London and the Maudsley NHS Trust, which is one of the biggest mental health trusts in the UK, they have an elect electronic database of mental health patient records, which is mostly in text and not structured. And they use natural language processing algorithms to extract information from this. So they extracted patient's diagnosis, their current medications, and anything that could interfere with that patient's life expectancy other than the medications, such as smoking. And these algorithms that they sent into the database were developed after humans looked at the records of a few hundred people. And then the algorithms were able to go and scan over 250,000 patient records. So what did the study find? Well, contrary to expectations, they found that patients who were given clozapine actually lived longer than patients who weren't. So this graph depicts over time in the patients who were given, um, this is a kind of rate of patients still alive at the end of the time period. So you can see the patients given clozapine, more of them are still alive, and fewer are still alive if they didn't get clozapine. And they said this is not not because of fewer suicides, and it's not because they're receiving more care. So they couldn't work out what, this, what the reason for this was, but they suggested that uh, perhaps the risks of prescribing clozapine have been exaggerated, and we should look more closely at its use. Okay, let's talk about extracting information from text, the kind of technical bit. So we know text is rich in information, but it is difficult to analyze. And to get resu reliable results that would apply to people across the country, we want to analyze data from many patients. So we can't sit and read the records and tick things off. We want to turn this text data into structured data, like a database of ones and noughts, information, this is present, this isn't present, and use that for statistical analysis. So how do healthcare text analytic researchers go about doing that? I'll go over this a couple of times. <coughs> Usually teams start with a few hundred records or documents, um, and then medical text would be de-identified. So patient identifiers would be stripped out so that this is you can't see the names, dates of birth, addresses, clinicians. And I'm going to talk much more about that towards the end of this session. Then a human looks at that medical text for a few hundred people's records and marks it up with marking up and telling a, a computer system what the relevant clinical information is in those records. And then that marked up training data is used to develop a computer program or algorithm which can then go and automatically extract similar pieces of information from other records or documents. And when that computer program is good enough, it can go and extract information from unseen records. 
that haven't been extracted from the NHS environment or haven't been seen by humans. So let's go over that in a more visual way. So we've got our NHS documents in the NHS environment. If they're going to come out of the NHS environment, historically they've needed to be de-identified. So re remove as much as possible any identifiers about the patient. And then a, pe uh, a human will look at them, usually a clinically trained annotator, will look at them and mark them up with the information that's needed to train a computer program. I keep standing in front of the <laughs> slide, sorry about that. A computer program which learns to do the same job. The computer program's output, how well they're doing the job, is checked by humans against real data. Has it done a good job? It's trained again, it's tuned up, and when it's good enough, it can be sent in back into the NHS environment and extract out data, clinical data about those patients in a coded form in a database, which is then used for statistical analysis and then we answer the clinical research problem that we started with. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Just a quick question. So when the algorithm goes back onto the, the NHS records at the bottom, they don't need to be de-identified because the algorithm is not looking at names. Yeah, so what comes out is it's de-identified because we're just extracting this kind of coded data that doesn't have any names or identifiers in it. Okay, so this is a kind of rough... A rough idea, this is not exactly perfectly describing every study, but if you take the kind of generic, what happens in most cases, this is a kind of reasonable way of explaining it. There are a few cases where uh, like researchers might want to look sort of qualitatively at, at what happens in people's lives, in which case they would need the full data and they wouldn't go on and develop uh, an algorithm, but that, I would say that's not, not quite such co so common. So I think a key question to ask at this stage is, could a computer program do all of that without a human being in the middle, annotating, checking, etc.? And at the current time, the answer is no. At the moment, information extraction technology, so this idea of taking the clinical information out of the text, has to be adapted to every new research question. So computers being able to read text is a capability that's very specific at the moment. It's specifically tailored to each research problem and each type of text or document. Some teams are trying to develop algorithms that learn by themselves without a human checking or supervising that learning. Um, so that might happen more in the future, but it's not uh, the, the current, it's not the way we would currently use da patient data because we couldn't be sure we were getting a high quality or usable result. And one of the reasons for that is there are a lot of challenges in human text. We've got uh, an example here about, uh, this was a, a published article um, that looked at breast pathology reports. So they had 76,000 reports about um, biopsies uh, of breast lumps. Within those 76,000 reports, they found 124 ways of saying invasive ductal carcinoma, which is a type of breast cancer, 95 ways of saying invasive lobular carcinoma, which is another type of breast cancer, and 33 types of negation. So negation is when it, that statement is negated. There wasn't any. It's not present. So if you multiply 33 by 124, you get a possible 4,000 different ways of saying that invasive ductal carcinoma was not present. This has to be taken into account when you're building the technology. Okay, so I'm going to move on. We've got quite a lot of things to cover. But I'm going to just talk a little bit about the governance, the rules, uh, whether people are allowed to use this free text. So probably all of you are aware the law changed um, with regards to personal data last May uh, with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which came into force in May 2018. Now, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what was happening before that, because obviously we want to move forward in light of this new regulation. So before, this is the way it was kind of approached. Personal data could be lawfully processed for a secondary purpose 
such as research, if it was rendered non-personal by removing identifiers and making it functionally anonymous. Now, this term anonymous is quite controversial. I think the ICO um, define it as the risk of re-identification being so low as to be pretty much negligible. Somebody can correct me on that if they want to. Um, but and in practice, free text was considered too personal, even if de-identified, to release out of NHS environments into university research environments. Because even when it was de-identified, which I'll talk about in a minute, some identifiers could slip through. The per it wasn't perfectly de-identified. Third parties could be identified from that data, that not the patient. And also, even if de-identified, the narrative or sequence of events in that text might be too revealing. So access was usually denied. So that SLAM, the Southland and the Maudsley case I showed you, they all work within the clinical environment, in fact. They, they have um, NHS research passports, and they don't take the data out of the NHS clinical environment, as far as I'm aware. So that was the case. We want to move forward to have a, a real conversation with the public about what should happen about free text data. And Karina will come and talk to you much more about that after me. So the other thing we're really interested in is what does the public think about free text data as opposed to coded data being used? Now, a colleague and I conducted a systematic review of all the literature we could find about public and patient opinions on the use of medical data being used for research to try and find out if we could find anything about free text as a specific question, and we found nothing. Nobody had asked patients. So we um, asked Heal Text for some money and commissioned a uh, citizen's jury um, uh, conducting the first piece of research about what the public might think about their free text being used, which ran in Brighton last June 2018. And we framed this question. So you've heard reasons to support the process of de-identifying, coding, and using free text data for health research. And you've heard reasons to be concerned about the process. Given these, to what degree do you support the use of free text data from patient records being used for health research? So first of all, what is a citizen's jury, you might be asking? We've given you a leaflet on your um, chair that summarizes the results of this study. Um, so a citizen's jury is a specific methodology that was designed in America 30 years ago and has been replicated a number of times. You may have heard of a citizen's assembly being suggested for solving the Brexit issue. So this is a bit similar to that, but it's smaller. A jury is usually a group of people of 12 to 24 people, representative of the area, and they commit between two and seven days to learn about and deliberate on a complex issue of policy. And in the end, they usually answer a clearly framed question. So the jury hears from expert witnesses who come in and explain all the different issues they need to know to really grasp the question. They hear from advocates who really try and sell a message from one side of the argument and somebody else who sells it from the other side of the argument. And then they can ask questions and they deliberate and discuss amongst themselves. So we had 18 people come uh, for a three-day jury in Brighton. We chose people who were representative of England's demographics, according to the census. And you had, as I said, the main question. So at the end of our jury, we found, to what degree do you support the use of free text data from patients' records from health research? Six of our jury were strongly supportive of its use, and 12 were fairly supportive, and none were neutral or unsupportive. Now, within our questionnaire, we also tried to tease out were their responses different for coded data or free text data? Did they feel more conservative about free text than codes? And also, did they feel more conservative about mental health than physical health, or vice versa? So we had a, a scenario of a patient called Tom who came to talk to his GP about diabetes and mental health problems. And the question was, should 
should the data, the GP data of patients like Tom be shared with the local university for research? Now, um, it's a bit difficult to pick out the, all the things in this table, but basically this first line relates to coded data, and you can see that eight said yes, share the data, and eight said only if patients can opt out, and two said only if patients can opt in. And with the following two, which were both about text data, patients were a little bit more conservative. So only four said, yes, share it. And 12 said, only if patients can opt out. And that was the same for both physical, so diabetes, and mental health data. The jury gave a lot of articulate views on why they supported data sharing. So they said that um, the data in free text was richer than coded data and it might enable better research, better treatments, which may save lives. And they, supported, they said they supported the opt-out system because they thought it would give a larger or more representative sample of the population for research than opt-in. But they also still had a lot of reasons to be concerned about data sharing. So they agreed that data processed to remove identifiers doesn't mean it's anonymous. And also here, computer programs are currently unable to remove identifiers with 100% accuracy. I'll give you some more details about that in a second. And that free text data is sensitive and inherently more identifying than coded data. <coughs> they acknowledged and they said that patient data could contain information about other patients, judgments, offhand comments, and other data requiring it, it required interpretation and it could therefore be misinterpreted by researchers. And then finally, that if people believe their data are unsafe, they may withhold important information from their doctor that could affect their clinical care. So they came out with two, well, a number of recommendations, but I've summarized them like this. One, if they said if, if free text data is being shared, fine, have an opt out, but you've got to have full transparency about the, where the data is going, what it's being used for, how it's being used, so that that opt-out is meaningful. And they asked that the research community should have a culture of continuously improving the technology to make sure to, to um, improve privacy and improve research quality. Okay, Lamise, it's, up, it's you up next um, to yeah. answer another important question. Mm. So you might be thinking at this point, why not just ask for consent? So lots of people supportive of health research. We often find there's great support for that. So one, one possible way of dealing with this problem might be just to ask people for their permission. But there's several reasons why an opt-out approach might be preferable, like you heard that the jury opted for. So it's worth going through a couple of those. Uh, consent, as we've heard, is just, just one of the legal basis for um, processing personal data provided that it's been de-identified to a sufficient standard. But over and above that, if you think of the ethical, ethical issues involved, you might think that autonomy, this idea that people have individual control, is the most ethical option, as it gives people complete control over what their data is being used for. Whilst you have a look at that, on the other side of the coin, it might actually place a higher burden. So when we've spoken to people, sometimes people perceive having to be constantly asked about uh, permissions to various types of research as a hassle. So you could argue that it could conversely place a burden on people. And if you do continue to ask people about every use of the data, it might be that it leads to a culture where people mindlessly are so-called ticking and clicking to long terms and conditions. So an opt-out isn't going to be appropriate for every type of research. We're not suggesting that this would be right for clinical trials, for example. But when it concerns, for example, data use in this way, you might want to consider the opt-out. The other reason, I've left the, 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 most strong, the reason it's often cited perhaps to last, is that if you do go for an opt-in system, then it might introduce bias into the system. What we might do then is that research might not be as representative and cover all the benefits for those marginalised groups, for example, who might not take the time to opt in or have those opportunities in the same way. So if we're engaging just a selective portion of the population, we could be coming to inaccurate conclusions. Lovely, thank you. OK, so I'm just going to talk in a little bit more depth about the technicalities of de-identifying free text. So that is taking out patient identifiers. 
So I want to talk about two methods. So the first one is blacklisting, or sometimes called redaction, or it's called scrubbing. So this is a letter. Um, you can see that the uh, initials, names, job title, or I think that's the hospital title, have been removed. This can happen by hand, if you've got a small number of records within the clinical environment, or it can be done by computers using de-identification algorithms. What are the risks? What might be the problems with this form? So algorithms can have uh, inaccuracy in one direction, which is called underscrubbing. So they leave in potential identifiers. So in this case, we've got uh, the beginning of a letter which talks about who the patient is and where she was seen. And in this case, our algorithm has run over it and it's taken out the name, it's taken out the, the date of birth, left in the birth year, and it's unfortunately left in the name of the unit where she was seen. So we might consider that a case of underscrubbing. But there's an, the opposite form of inaccuracy, which is overscrubbing. So that's misidentifying important clinical information as identifiers and taking them out. And if you think of a quite a lot of medical conditions, they share their name with people, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, even something like blood sugar, you might think sugar is a name. So overscrubbing is taking out important clinical information. An example is here. So diverticular abscess, LS drained, Mr. Harding. So our algorithm has taken out Harding as a name, but it also thought that LS, which I think means left side, was the initials of somebody, and it's taken that out. So um, as an example, a specially built anonymization program for GP record text was evaluated on a reference of 50,000 words. And in terms of inaccuracies, in terms of underscrubbing, it left in nearly 2% of words and overscrubbing 0.2% of words. So how does that convert to understanding a risk of re-identification for the patients in that database? Unfortunately, we don't know. But we can't quantify how likely you are to be re-identified from that accuracy of an a, a de-identification algorithm. To re-identify somebody, you need either some identifiers to slip through, or you need a unique combination of events. You also need an extra source of information about the person you want to find, such as another database you could link in that has their identifiers or even a newspaper article or personal knowledge of the person, and you need a motivation to try and re-identify them. Okay, so let's just move on to what I said. I said I talked about two methods of de-identifying. So something else that's used is, is whitelisting. So have you got a question? right or left yeah. because as it important you say taking it out as well for identification but I would think knowing if it is right or left for whatever it is would this be quite one, important this example yeah yes yes it's a mistake the algorithm made a mistake unfortunately so we it, it's a, a shame that that information was taken out yeah thank you um, so whitelisting is another option so we use an, an algorithm or a search to isolate the relevant clinical information from personal identifiers, and that's brought out of the, te of the medical record for evaluation. So that could be, for example, medication dosage instructions uh, in an epilepsy study, or the stage or grade of cancers in pathology reports, for example, could be identified by an algorithm <coughs> and brought through for, the, for evaluation by the researchers. So here's an example. This is a, a patient record which has been pseudonymized with a Star Wars filter. <laughs> Dear Dr. Skywalker. <laughs> um, so you can see here the machine is uh, picking up medications. 
it's picking up dosages and it's picking up how often uh, that should be taken. But what are the limitations of a whitelisting approach? Lamis, will you help me out here? Of course. Does this patient have inflammation? Definitely. Unfortunately, no, they don't. We didn't pick up, if we just pull out the name, the word inflammation, we've missed out the context that it was written. How about painful joints? Definitely, maybe. He denies any painful joints. So do we even know as humans whether he's got painful joints or not? Diabetes, do you think he's got diabetes? I've got to be right this time, yes. Uh, no, it's his mother. His mother has diabetes. Sarcoidosis, do we even know what that is? It's best that I step out at this point, really, <laughs> isn't it? So he may have sarcoidosis now. He did have it in the past. We don't know if he's got it now. Now, do you think we can know this one? All right. <laughs> Symptoms suggest. So again, even the doctor's not sure. So we've got these different parts of the context within text that we need to be able to model to really know that the quality of data we're extracting is good. So we've got negation. There wasn't any. We've got the, the subject, the person the, the text is referring to. We've got the timing. Is it now or is it in the past? And we've got certainty that we can model as well. OK. So that's what I'm going to leave you there in terms of de-identification. Um, and we've just got one more set of things to go through, and then we can take a few questions. Hmm. So we've talked a lot about the benefits of free text. So I think it's worth just covering some of the common concerns for, for balance in this argument. So when public opinion surveys, studies, such as our jury, but also more widely looking at the reuse of data, found that there's a number of common concerns people have when sharing this type of data. So the first one is that risk of re-identification, and you've heard a lot about that today. And it may be as simple that people don't like the idea of that loss of privacy, that there may be a possibility that people would find out things fundamentally that you just didn't want them to know. And that could lead to all sorts of other things, uh, that risk. So it could be that they might be denied services or particular benefits. It could be that their insurance premiums go up. There's also this idea that data might be used for purposes that are legal, but that you don't support personally, that you'd rather be asked about. So some people have a problem about commercial companies being involved in accessing their data, for example, so that if the primary purpose is for profit making rather than patient benefit, they might prefer that their data wasn't used for that, for that purpose. There might be concerns about data security. Uh, so people might be worried that their data is not secure and that actually making it more accessible to the likes of researchers or others might mean that it's more accessible to everyone, including hackers or fear illegal uses of the data, such as identity theft. And finally, that's the idea that if people suspect their data might be shared beyond for the purposes of their immediate direct care, they might start to become reluctant to share things or disclose important information. And that could lead to a loss of trust in medical confidentiality, but also in the NHS more generally and with research as a whole. So there are some reasons to be cautious for you. Okay. So what do we hope we've taken away from today? So, I hope... Oh. <laughs> okay. Put it back. We haven't there got, you uh, go. Oh, we've got some learning points. Great. Yeah. So, hopefully what you feel we've covered is that medical data is recorded in both codes and free text, that valuable clinical information is held in free text across the health system, and this could be used for research. De-identification of free text can be done by computers and can be good, but not perfect. To get reliable results, we want to analyze data from as many patients as possible, so we try to turn text into structured data for analysis. Computer algorithms can be trained to extract information from vast numbers of free text documents and convert it into valuable data. And again, these are good. Ag algorithms work well, but they're not perfect. And that our citizens' jury that we conducted found that uh, the public, members of the public were supportive of the use of free text for research, but had a number of concerns. So following the jury. Um, my colleague Professor Karina Jones from Swansea has taken up the baton to try and work out 
how we could take forward developing some data governance standards and ideas around using free text that would work within the current framework of patient data reuse within the UK. And she's going to come and talk to you now about those, uh, those ideas and recommendations that we're coming up with. It's very much a work in progress, and that's why we've invited you to come and comment on them, um, which we'll be doing this afternoon. Um, but before she comes, would anybody like to ask any questions about what we've covered this morning? Yeah, can you wait for the microphone? Thanks. Thank you. Um, after you've produced your coded data set from the running the, um, the AI, AI algorithm, how do you assess the level of risk of that data set for re-identification purposes? Mm. It's a, a good question. Karina, do you want to? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, well, I suppose that depends on how and where it's being used for one thing. But generally, there would be an assessment. You can do a manual assessment. Uh, that could only do a small number of records, really, to see whether any possible identifiers have been left behind. Or you can run a different algorithm over it and do a comparative analysis to see if running a different algorithm would have given the same results or would pick up something additional. So there would be different ways. And I mean, with some of the models, though, as we mentioned, some of them are stay within the NHS. The permissions and approvals may be different. So there may be so different that would be threats. A governance yes. Issue, not yes. <laughs> And yeah. so have you thought about onward data sharing? Yes, yes, we have. We've, we've thought about that in relation to going to really data safe havens that are in the public sector but not in the NHS. So we have thought about that. I'll mention something about that when I talk about it because there's some work going on with that. But basically, yes, there'd be the analysis of the actual de-identification of the data but also a consideration of where that data would be used and the context in which that's used and what the permissions around that need to be. Yeah, should we? Oh. Can, uh, can I use this one? Yeah, sure. <coughs> Hi. Um, just thinking about the citizen's jury, yeah. um, it's a really interesting sort of uh, technique and approach. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but how confident can you be that that is representative and there's no sort of um, engagement bias or anything like that? And also, are there any plans to take that wider and maybe do like a some sort of national survey or something to capture the views of people who maybe would not have engaged with that yeah. citizen's yeah. jury? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. Yeah, so obviously we could match, uh, our, there's only 18 people, so we can't say it's really representative of everybody. It may be representative of an informed public, but obviously once you've tr sort of trained them for three days, so think about the issues, they're, they're not the same as the general public anymore. Um, Brighton has a very special, peculiar kind of demographic anyway. So that was why we tried to match them to the census. So it could be that they were um, not representative of the, of the population. But what we tried to do was we, we asked them questions about their views before we recruited them. So we made sure that we had a selection of people who were willing and unwilling to share their records before they came in. And we also had an oversight panel who reviewed all the materials um, to make sure we weren't biased in our present presentation of of information and then we asked the jury members of perception of bias within the jury materials at the end as well so we did as many things as we could to try and address that issue the issue that we've got um, is of course if you ask the general public the, the, the answer you're going to get is is quite it's it's tricky because not many people know how records are structured unless they've worked in this field already I mean, we would say that um, that this is the jury is the first one to look at free text specifically, but we've done a series of, we've been involved in a series of juries now, and they all seem to come to similar conclusions, similar concerns in a similar way when it comes to questions about uh, reusing data for the purposes of data sharing. So this isn't, I think it seems to coincide and be backed up with the research out there from larger surveys when you look at people who've done at, at work in this area, like Ipsos Mori, for example, when they have their, their huge surveys. But it, it tackles that question about what people would think if they're informed. So it gives us something different. You have to see it as alongside that. Okay. 
Um, you pointed out that re-identifying the identified data is actually quite difficult usually, um, even when it's done not particularly well. It, you, it really requires some intent and uh, an effort to do that. And you also mentioned GDPR, and the, the three principles of that seem to be that you tell people exactly what data you're collecting and show it to them. Um, you <coughs> tell them what you're going to do with that data, and importantly, promise not to do anything else with that data. And then finally, you ask them, OK, if you want to opt out of this, you can do. And yeah. you then do that. But that, that middle one, the telling them what you're going to do with the data and promising not to do anything else, if you tell them that you're using that data for research, but you will de-identify it, and anybody using that data will not re-identify you, mm. then doesn't that kind of solve this problem? It could do. Um, what do you think, Lamis? I think I think the issue is if you're if you're creating centralised databases of electronic health records that people can then apply to to use for new purposes. We don't know in advance when we collect the data what research might be done with them. Then how do you communicate that idea of any purpose we're going to tell you in advance? But the, the process of re-identifying you mm. would always be banned. Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a legal problem and there's an ethical problem. So one of the things that we're we're picking up is that is that even if some of these types of research are legal, that we might lose trust if people are opposed to the types of purposes that we want to use them for. So I agree with what you're saying in that it could be done, but it sometimes there's a question of what, what we want to do and what we should do. Karina, do you have an answer to that as well? And then we'll go to Alan. I could comment on, on that one. Um, exactly what you said, is, is, it's brilliant, but what you actually did was you identified that although the risk is small, there is a small risk. And that would be the, the challenge, really, is being able to convey that in a, a proper way to give transparency, but to enable people to decide whether that risk is an acceptable thing, really. Because it's not totally impossible that one day someone could identify someone, but it's just that, you know, ex the acceptability, really, of, of that risk, yeah, even though it's small. So, Alan... Um uh, just two points. I, I, I think I'm sure we will come on to think about it in a minute uh, later. Is that uh, <coughs> data is collected for the purpose of direct care usually, and to use it for other purposes, including to de-identify that data, you probably, though this is still up for discussion, need a legal basis for actually doing that. Um, so, uh, and health and care professionals includes a whole load of different groups of people, but they are often more worried, or at least as worried about the duty of confidence as they are about GDPR and privacy law. So it's just to put that back into perspective. Okay. Should we just, Chris wanted to say something, and then this gentleman at the back, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, just a couple of points. First one on the, the citizen <laughs> jury. I have had some involvement around the periphery of some of previous juries, not this one, looking at making sure that the bias was minimised, if not removed. It's a really robust process. It's worth having to read through about their methodologies. It, it, it's, it's a nice piece of work, so just to assure you on some of those things. Um, a couple of other comments. On your slides, you've got the three bits about how you would re-identify. And the bottom one for me, I was really pleased you put it on, which was motivation, I think the chap on the front said as well. Mm -hmm. Frankly, without that, the, the re-identification identification doesn't isn't going to happen. happen the key thing is motivation to me has to be motivated to do it and then you're looking at minimizing the risk after that so i'm just pleased to see you put that on the other one is around risk whenever we're talking about risk we also need to talk about benefits mm -hmm. so people are not just wanting to look at free text records because they quite fancy it there's a real benefit that we need to describe to people that could be accrued by using some of this data which you touched on earlier um and the last bit was a question on your citizens jury did you measure the, uh, the the view of the juries at the start and at the end after they've been through their education process. I think that's really interesting around what the public would think. If yeah. you measure at the start, you're essentially looking at people. Mm -hmm. At the end, you're looking at um, informed people. Was yeah. it, did you measure it? Was it yes, we um, we use the Ipsos Mori question about willingness to share health records, 
and we, sh so we found people shifted in both directions, but overall there was a general shift to more willingness. Um, so did you still have a question? Yeah. Can, can, I make, can I make one tiny point on, on something Chris said? Um, I think as well as the risks in using the data and the benefits, there's also think about the risks of not using the data, mm. and that applies to free text data, but health data in general, what mm. happens if we don't? Mm. You know, how do we progress research if we don't use the data? Uh, I agree with all the, the comments, except I, I would just surely that the risk is not a static risk. Yeah. It varies according to the prevalence of the conditions that mm -hmm. your algorithms are actually pulling out, mm -hmm. so that there are plenty of conditions that are, are perfectly um, amenable to research, but they may be very small numbers of people in the community that you're looking at who actually have that particular um, uh, attributes. So uh, the, the risks that we're talking about are not static, they're not all low, it depends on exactly the data that you're pulling out and yeah. I think that needs to be made clear as well. Yeah. Okay, we're just going to finish, so I'm sorry we can't take all your questions, we'll just finish with a, a comment from Dawn and then Karina m must come up otherwise we'll all be late for lunch which I'm sure will make <laughs> you sad. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on it, I, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll touch on it this afternoon, is um, education, education, education is, mm. is, is kind of key in, yeah. in this, as we know. Um, I wanted to pick up on the point about motivation, because under GDPR it is a criminal offence. If you as an individual do re-identify that data, that's something that's really strong in there. Mm -hmm. However, pseudonymized, anonymized data is a dynamic data state. Mm -hmm. And it's very dependent on who's doing that de-identification and where it's being disseminated to and what else they hold. And the key bit, purpose is king. Mm. You never could, under privacy law, and you still cannot, collect data without knowing what the purpose is going to be for using it or collect it for one purpose and use it for another. Okay. But the key bit, and Alan touched on it, around the legality here, the GDPR is not the problem. We can easily get over the GDPR issues. Okay. It's the common law duty of confidence okay. that is the issue. Thank you. OK, we're going to wrap up there. There are discussion groups this afternoon when I hope you'll all um, engage with um, telling your group your views. But in the meantime, um, Karina is going to come and talk about the TexGov project. So, hi everyone, you've met me already as the person who runs around with that wonderful orange cube. Um, my first slide here is a picture of some lovely patient notes. And just as a little funny, really, um, where I work in the university, there's a hospital nearby. And sometimes I go over to the hospital for my lunch and I go to the hospital canteen. And in the summer, when I walk past the room which is full of medical records, someone's nodding, the door is wide open. And I can see racks and racks. It's not the photograph. That's not those um, but I can see racks and racks of patient notes and I just think oh, okay never mind <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk to you about the TextGov project which is about looking at data governance standards for working with free text data I probably will cover some of the things that Liz and Lamise have touched upon but it'll probably be in a slightly different context so hopefully uh, not too duplicative um, so there's an identified need for clearer data governance standards, not for something completely new, because we're not suggesting that free text is different. It's, it's still health data, and it's not actually specified as different in data protection law. But there are issues around it, as we've heard, in terms of the greater difficulty in being sure that it's uh, de-identified. So it can come from all sorts of places, clinic letters, <laughs> the things doctors jot down in consultations. And generally, it's not included in what we think of as the coded record, which may be extracted for large-scale research or, or national audits and such like. Um, it is the untapped potential is the thing, because what it provides is the context, perceptions and emotions, as we saw with the sketch, and things like, you know, the actual patient story. And we all, you know, we've all got anecdotes. We could probably reel off about things that are put in doctor's notes about FLK and FLP, you know, for funny-looking kid and funny-looking parent, and all these things that probably shouldn't be in there, but other more sensible notes uh, as well. 
Um, so it can be harder to re-identify, as we've heard, because of the methods that need to be employed compared to when you've got a uh, name, etc., and you can remove that from a structured record. But it's not defined as different in data protection legislation, and so we need to find a balance so that we can do this safely to enable research to proceed. So if we just looked at this very simple example of some... Does this thing work on here? Can you see it? Oh, it's a special screen, isn't it? Doesn't work. Okay. Um, if you look over there, you've got a very simple example of a coded record where I've just shown surname. So that if you want to de-identify that, you can remove the identifying variables because they tend to be just in those fields. Whereas when you've got a clinic letter, you've got Mr. Bloggs, Andy Bloggs, you've got the name of the person seeing them, and, and it can be anywhere within that, um, which makes it harder then. It can't just be done in the same way as de-identifying structured data. And if we want to analyse free text data or data derived from free text data with that structured data, we need to be able to put it into a structured form because otherwise what we've got are some structured fields and some words and you can't actually do statistical analysis when you've got that. So there's a need for that data to be able to be de-identified but also further processed so that it can be analysed. So that's what exactly what we're trying to do then is to look at these data governance standards that could be uh, could enable this to happen. And the way the project has worked, it's coming towards an end now uh, by the end of April. We carried out a rapid literature review to look at data governance models that are already used and are in the published literature on how free text data has been used for research. We've looked at the relevant legislation and regulations <coughs> to see are there any differences, is there anything extra that needs to be taken into account. Public views, I mean Liz has talked a lot about that, we're doing a little bit more of that as well. And we've held a workshop with free text mining researchers and we got their views and also consulting with other experts and stakeholders. So you all come into that sort of category there. So when we looked at the published articles, what we found was, although the data governance may well have been you know, properly addressed, it wasn't always set out how people had done that. It wasn't always set out that they had accessed data via a particular method or what approvals they'd obtained. And sometimes the reason for that was because they accessed free text data that was contained in large systems holding free text data and they abided by the methods that were in place there. And there were a number of different ways in which free text data was accessed. Sometimes released to researchers such as GP data from CPRD. Now there's a little star there because CPRD have stopped handling free text data and they no longer make it available to researchers. In fact, they've deleted their back catalogue of free text data as well. THIN, is the Health Informatics <coughs> Network, they allow remote access to free text data, but they also release, but only small amounts of free text data can be released externally. Then we have the CRIS system, which I think stands for Clinical Records Interactive Search, which is implemented in a number of mental health trusts, including South London and the Maudsley. Now that is accessing de-identified free text data, but it remains within the NHS system. It remains behind NHS firewalls. Then another example is the SAIL data bank, which is where I come from. Um, and we're working towards being able to access de-identified free text in a non-NHS data safe haven. Then there were some other studies, a kind of random bunch really, of independent studies, small scale studies that had gained their own approvals and such like and were not connected with any of these big systems. But the vast majority so far of the published articles were from CPRD, THIN or from the CRIS system. So in terms of what do we mean by needing clearer data governance standards, well if you think about free text data from origin onwards, so it's in the clinic letter, it's in the notes, etc. There's first of all, how do researchers gain access to or ab are able to work with identifiable data? 
because there's a need to use identifiable data in order to develop the algorithms, or at least it's, it's pretty much needed. It's hard to do everything needed with synthetic data and data that's already de-identified because you need to prove the point that the algorithms can actually take the identifiers out. There's clinician engagement, how to work with clinicians that still maintains uh, confidentiality of the data and patient privacy. There's data provider readiness and data system readiness and due diligence processes in different organisations. Then you have the reliability and how to evaluate the data uh, de-identification methods, which is a huge area of research, and public perceptions, another big area of research. How data are managed, um, what about linkage, different access models, as I mentioned, whether data are released or whether they're retained in the NHS or whether they're used in a university setting are all needing to be considered. And the risk assessment in data to be used, as we had from the back there, how do you assess data that's going to be made available to researchers to ensure it's adequately de-identified before they're given access to it? And then all sorts of permissions and approvals, which could be at any stage in that process there, and possibly more things as well. So I picked up those two uh, from the list there as being the large areas of work that's ongoing. Now, Liz has already touched on these, so I won't go into that very much, actually. Um, but basically, three, three, three types, in a way, Keyword extraction is a bit like whitelisting. Keyword extraction would just pick particular words, let's say uh, medication names. Blacklisting selects things that you can't have. Whitelisting selects things that you can have, but can include more than single words. So it, it is possible to include strings as long as the, uh, it is whitelisted, basically, then. So it's not considered to contain any identifiable data. And the risks between um, Blacklisting and whitelisting, of course, leaving valuable information behind or extracting some potentially identifiable data. And as yet, the methods are not completely perfect, uh, but that's a matter of conveying, as we have from the front there, really, um, the, the imperfection. But even with structured data, even with coded data, I mean, if you've got wide data sets, you'll have unique combinations of variables that with a motivated intruder, you could possibly piece information together, you know. But again, one of the things to remember is that just because something's unique doesn't mean it's identifiable, you know. Just because you've got a unique string, you know, that may not mean you, you can re-identify the person. Again, I suppose another point I would make, which comes up, up in some of the debates in the literature, is what sort of re-identification are we talking about? Let's say it's someone's uh, name and address, that's one thing, okay. If there's no attached information, well, we have that on the census, let's say. That may be different to knowing someone's name and they have a rare or sensitive condition or knowing someone's name and they have type 2 diabetes, okay. You know, so there are also more, it's more than identification or not de-identification and it's also more than that's unique, therefore, it's a huge risk because perhaps it is and perhaps it isn't. So this is just an example of clinic letter, a bit like the one Liz showed you, but it's like just a slight different version really, where we've got Dr. Verb sees Miss Alice Green and these are some of the diagnosis uh, inf inferences he makes, medication. Um, but if you think about a simple blacklisting method, then it would take out names, okay? But green can be a name, and it can also be a descriptor. So where we have down here, blah, 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 Alice has a white lesion, we may lose that as well. Um, so th there, there, there are issues with, with lexicon-based blacklisting that can mean you lose descriptors as well. With the one I mentioned, the CRIS system, their system isn't based on a lexicon system. Because they're behind the NHS firewall, what they have is their algorithm is able to view the patient's record. It's an algorithm system, so it views the patient's record. So it can see 
what the names, the relevant names contained in that patient record are, and then it can take those out because it knows exactly what they are. Because let's face it, we've got so many names, we've got multicultural society, lexicons are really hard to build in a reliable way. So that's one way that can be improved on blacklisted is that method that can specifically look at each record and relate, oh, these are the significant names that I need to pull out here. So we held a, a workshop in January, which was, which was great, and um, we discussed all sorts of issues with the free text research community, and they picked out some areas and discussed them further, and the challenges they recognised were uh, gaining access to identifiable data <coughs> for working for de-identification and extraction algorithms, the de-identification methods and what are the thresholds of reliability, recognising, as we had from the back, that they vary. It's not a one-size-fits-all threshold, but it needs to be taken into account the, the risk, the nature of the condition, the sort of research someone wants to do and what they plan to do with that. Um, information around patient involvement at all stages and also scalability in NLP algorithm development um, because there's a certain amount of work that can be done with small scale data sets, but if we want to be more reliable, then we need access to larger scale data sets. So in terms of preliminary recommendations coming out of the TechSCOV project, sorry, this is a bit of a busy slide. Now, I'll stress first of all that some of these relate equally to coded health data but there are elements that also relate more so to free text data. So we're not trying to create something that's different for free text data, but there are some particular things. So clear information on data uses and the opt-out options. Now, opt-out options do vary by jurisdiction. You have opt-out beyond direct care in England. We don't have this in, in Wales. We don't have it in Scotland either. But as an example um, for the Sale Data Bank, which is a population data bank of de-identified data about the people of Wales, people can opt out via their GP. They can just go to their GP and say, I don't want my data processed for this purpose, and then they can be removed. Um, data minimization, only using what's necessary, and that again will depend on purpose and research <laughs> question which access models we would actually recommend that free text data is only accessed within the data safe haven because of the risks. That does tend to be a trend now, in general anyway, towards moving towards data safe havens for structured data as well, and particularly for the emerging data types like genomic data, where there are considered to be other perceived risks over and above standard health data. The need for proper researcher approvals to work with the data in whichever form they're accessing them. Continuous improvement, continue to work, and obviously data are needed for that, and then to build up from there. And more automa automation so that the need for humans to see the free text data is minimised. Um, we may never achieve perfection, but if we can move in that direction, then that's a good thing. We're proposing also a resource of free text data to support methodological developments. We don't know how that would work, but it's an interesting thought that perhaps people, maybe people would be willing to say, OK, I'm happy to make my free text data available. You can play with my data and you can use it for your algorithm development. And standardising the data pathways in working with custodians, what sort of approvals are needed. And the important thing, as with all data, that researchers should publicise their results widely, but including patients in that, making sure information gets back in a general reader summary <coughs> to people. So those are really the recommendations and a, a brief run through of the study. So now we come to working with you, and this is what we'd like to do with you later on in the day. So we'd like your thoughts on the use of free text data and how it can be used. What are the knowledge gaps? What does the public need more information on? How can this be addressed? How can patients be involved? What would you say the do's and don'ts are? And possible solutions and how success can be measured. So what we're going to have is lunch is next. Ooh, I'm being good. Lunch is next, I'm quite finished. And, um, then we will have a panel, and then after the panel, we've got a number of workshops. There's a sign-up there for the workshops, and you can see the titles above, plus an open discussion, which could be another topic, 
or if you've got a suggestion for a topic, please write it on and we'll take them all into consideration over lunch. Or it may be that if a lot of people sign up for one of the workshops, then we'll just have a spillover group. So they are on transparency and patient choice, identification, de-identification and anonymity, data access models and security, future capabilities of technology, and as I mentioned, that last one. So we'll give you more information about where you need to go in the rooms when we come back after lunch. Um, but for now, all I'd say is please enjoy your lunch. I've managed to finish just before time <coughs> for you. And add your name to there, and we'll take it from there afterwards. Thank can you very I, much. Ooh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Karina. Um, so if I can just say, so we've... Karina, can you, would you take a couple of questions? Yes, of course, yes. So we'll have a couple of questions, but um, one fifteen, we're back in this room for um, the panel discussion. So we're really, really thrilled to have um, four people sitting on the panel. So that's Dawn Monaghan, who's Head of Data Sharing and Privacy from NHS England. We've got Alan Hassey from the Office of the National Data Guardian. We've got Natalie Banner from Understanding Patient Data at the Wellcome Trust. And we've got Debbie Keatley, who's uh, our patient representative from Use My Data. Um, so they're going to be, they've already read a, a document um, about the TexGov project, and they're going to be giving us their thoughts. Um, and then you can all ask um, the panel members, which will include Karina and Goran, questions. And we'll have a session where we all kind of clarify and deepen our understanding of the issues. Following a tea break after that, then we'll have our group discussions where we hope that you'll work in a group to come up with some potential solutions for the outstanding issues and then a feedback session before the end. Yeah. So, um, and lunch is in a room called Ada Augusta, which is at the far end, just beyond the kitchen. So if anybody has a question for Karina, you're welcome to ask it. Um, we'll just take, let's say, two or three questions and then... Go for lunch. Just a very quick one. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what kind of scale you would need to achieve in terms of, you know, how how many patient records do you mm. need for the research to be valuable? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh I see. For the re not for the de-identification method, but for the research to be valuable. Well, I guess both. Like, how many how many patient records would you need to develop a good de-identifying yeah. algorithm? Yeah. And then how how many patient records would you need to be able to run valuable research? Okay. Answer to the first question, it depends. Answer to the second question, it depends. I suppose um, for the de-identification algorithms, I would always say as many as possible. Would you agree there, Goran? Because you're really looking to do validation there. Yeah. So you're looking for as wide a breadth of records as you can to cover as many types of conditions, to cover as many names, to cover all sorts of information that could possibly be there. So really you would want to reach saturation on the sort of information you could expect that to be contained. Like, you know, hundreds of thousands, like millions, oh, no, tens probably, of millions. Probably not no, millions. No, 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 no. So for the development of uh, yeah. natural mm. language processing algorithms, we're talking about thousands. Mm. If it is a very supervised method, if it is unsupervised or semi-supervised, may, maybe 100,000. Yeah. But, but, but usually we are talking about thousands of records that we need to develop algorithms. And then once you have the algorithms, yeah. you can then run them on all the data. You don't see actually mm. uh, free text data anymore, so, so it is not a problem with the, the identification, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. so, so the only problem, apart from what, what I think uh, Liz mentioned at the beginning, there might be some qualitative researchers who would like to see uh, the real free text data, mm. but this is, this is not really the, 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 the key problem. For the development of algorithms, you need thousands of examples, mm -hmm. but not millions, not, not, nothing, yeah. not, 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 nothing like that. Yes, yes. And in terms of your research question, I suppose it's the same with any, really any research question. Depends what, what it is, yeah. Okay, we'll have one last question from over there. Then I won't keep you from your lunch anymore. Thank you. <laughs> uh, related to the question, are there any data sets available that can act as um, training data sets to um, develop these de-identification algorithms? Excellent. Well done, Lamis. So, yes, there are, but there are data sets that are available from, from the states, mostly. So, in the UK, we don't have a publicly available data sets that you can use. So, we, we don't, because of all the reasons that we mentioned today, so they are usually capped in a particular safe haven, so in, mm. in, in Sale Data Bank in uh, South London and Mosley. So, 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 people have those, but even 
sharing the training data that's been de-identified is, is a challenge. So we've been working on that, how to, do, how to uh, generate synthetic data from those data sets. So you have a data set and then you do some kind of statistical, <laughs> statistical changes in the, in the data set that you can share the synthetic data with a significantly reduced risk of re-identification. Thank, thank you, Karina. Oh, thank you all very much. Thank you.